So my, my research is um, mostly in, in, in non-equilibrium statistical mechanics at temperatures, I mean room temperatures sort of rather pleasant and maybe even lower temperatures. And I realized that there's a huge gap, I mean from sort of uh, relative to, to most of the audience here who work at temperatures or energies which are sort of, you know, I mean, infinitely from, from, from my point of view. And uh, so, so it's, it's a wide field. And uh, um, so I was thinking about a topic which sort of uh, has a sort of unifying aspect, kinetic theory, uh, you know, was developed in the context of low density gases, but it, it's somehow a universal concept and also applies to high energy physics and other areas of physics. And I thought this would be a good topic. I mean, it's sort of one of my favorite topics. I, worked on this for many years. And so uh, before telling you what, what, what I actually sort of uh, plan to do, uh, let me uh, sort of remind you of uh, what we learned 150 years or even longer ago. So this is Ludwig Boltzmann, 1872, and uh, he was considering uh, a low density gas. So think of a, a gas like here in this room, but uh, he had already sort of this microscopic intuition that it would consist of many particles. And uh, you can think of his purposes sort of like little hard balls, which are sort of reflecting from these other balls sort of elastically. Okay, and now um, uh, that's a, you know, it's an interacting system. It's fairly complicated. I mean, it's not so completely clear how to do it. And so his idea was that uh, each particle has a position, so this is x, and the velocity. And so these many particles, I mean, just like the many particles in this room, can be sort of uh, represented as a cloud of points in this what people call the one-particle phase space. Now, when you look at low temperatures, uh, sorry, if you look at low density, then uh, you realize that sort of the relevant space and time scale are given by the mean free pass. I mean, that's sort of the pass which sort of a particle uh, moves freely without any collisions, and the corresponding mean free time. I mean, that's sort of the time it takes on average to the, to the, to the next collision. And uh, the velocities one considers to be of order one, so the energy per particle is also of order one in, in these kind of units. Now, what he proposed is that he said, well, if you now look at sort of a little volume element on the kinetic scale, you realize that there are a huge number of particles in this little volume element. And so you would think that to the first order, I mean, this is just a completely deterministic number, and you can sort of represent it as a fraction of the total number of particles. So the number of atoms in this little volume element near the point x and v are given by is proportional to n, and this proportionality factor is uh, what we call the Boltzmann f function or the Boltzmann function. Okay. Now, um, uh, this is sort of what we call typical. I mean, this at the time, I mean, this was extremely confusing to of his fellow physicists. I mean, you know, he had to talk about random initial data, and this was sort of a little bit off the sort of standard Newtonian scheme where you're sort of thinking of fixed initial conditions. In any case, I mean, let me not dwell on this point. Let me just sort of mention another thing is that there is a convection term. I mean, so there's the leading term, which is proportional to n, but then there's a fluctuating co convection, which is of order of the square root of n, which does contain lots of interesting physical effects. I mean, for instance, one very prominent example is that if you prepare, let's say, a fluid in a, in a, uh, under a thermal gradient, so you sort of impress, uh, you enforce from outside the thermal gradient, then the system will develop uh, sort of weak long-range forces, which actually can see in, in scattering experiments. If you do sort of small angle scattering, I mean, you can actually see this. So this is sort of contained in the, in the dot, 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 which I'm not going to talk about. I mean, the, the whole talk will be sort of about this sort of uh, leading term, just a number of particles in a little, a little on the kinetic scale uh, volume element in the, uh, in the one particle phase space. Well, what, what, what Boltzmann argued is that uh, at the collision, you can sort of say that the incoming, uh, the, the velocities of the two incoming particles incoming into the, pollution, uh, into the collision can be considered as sort of uh, more or less independent, so he assumed them to be independent, and out of this you get a closed equation for this function f, which is sort of the famous Boltzmann equation. So here's the standard structure, I mean, it has a flow term, which just tells you that the particles are transported freely, 
according to free motion. But then, of course, the most interesting point is that you have this collision term, which, I've, which I will not spell out during the talk at all, but the, the main point is that it's nonlinear. It's actually quadratic in this f function. Okay? Now, you might have voice, you know, but it's actual derivation of Boltzmann, and, and of course, his contemporaries were not so completely convinced at the, when at the time it was written. But when you look at the properties of this equation, it really solved a truly outstanding problem. Namely, what he could show is that under this equation, the entropy actually increases, and when you look at the long time limit, it converges to uh, what we call the thermal or the uh, uh, Boltzmann-Maxwell or Gibbs-Maxwell distribution. So this means that in the long time limit, the velocity distribution of these particles actually does become Maxwellian. And you can estimate from the equation how long such a relaxation process takes. And that's, of course, is something which, which, you know, even nowadays, I mean, to do this sort of on the basis of, uh, you know, the, the full Newtonian mechanics of particles is a very difficult problem. Now, uh, what, uh, what, um, um, what I would like to sort of point out is that kinetic theory, I mentioned this already, but let me sort of emphasize it a little bit more. Kinetic theory is actually used widely. I mean, you can use it in plasma physics, and of course you have to take the Coulomb interactions into account. Waves, I mean, that will be part of the topic. I mean, one topic, I mean, so it's wave turbulence, condensed matter physics, transport of electrons and phonons. Of course, we have sort of very sophisticated many particle methods, but you know, it's, it's to a to large extent sort of the bread and butter is very often sort of a, some version of a transport equation which is similar to the, uh, to, to the, has a similar structure as the Boltzmann equation. You can look at the early in universe, the nuclear synthesis, so this is the Big Bang nuclear synthesis, I mean, three minutes. Uh, after uh, sort of uh, the initial time of the universe. I mean, th that's, that's a, 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 another example where, where kinetic theory is very heavily. And I just want to point out one thing. I mean, you know, very often people ask about sort of, you know, I mean, here you have these theoretical physicists and they're doing fairly abstract business. I mean, is there any, any sort of feedback to, to what, what uh, the society uh, would be interested in? I just want to emphasize, use this occasion to emphasize one point. I mean, you know, I mean, you, 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 you want to build cars and typically once you have sort of a model, then you have to put it in a wind tunnel so that you can see sort of its, its uh, properties. Um, uh, and um, uh, wind tunnels are expensive and so you want to replace a wind tunnel by a computer. Now, computer basically means that you have to solve equation of, of the Boltzmann type uh, because you, you cannot really use fluid dynamical equations because, you know, the obstacles against which this flow is uh, pressing, I mean, it, it, it's a little bit, uh, you know, it's not, not regular enough, and, and these boundary conditions make fluid dynamical equations difficult. And therefore, what, you know, many engineers and, and all kinds of people uh, uh, developed is a, is a numerical scheme which is called Lattice Boltzmann. I just want to emphasize this Lattice Boltzmann is an invention of a theoretical physicist. It was Yves Pomo who first forward this as a possible way of actually getting numerical solutions to the Boltzmann equation. Of course, in the meantime, to, to you know, put this up to a level where it can be really used, I mean, you know, there, there, I mean, enormous efforts uh, you know, had to be invested, but, but the original idea is really Yves Pomo. Okay, so now what, what, what I would like to sort of do in this uh, short time um, uh, I, I want to, you know, it's a conceptual talk. I'm, I'm, I'm writing down equations just to, as a guideline. I mean, I'm not, not talking about properties of these equations at all, but what I would like to do is I want to sort of explain to you what is sort of the, the true dynamical structure which is behind such a kinetic equation. Now, once you understand that, you know, it's very easy and, and, and more or less, uh, I mean, not completely straightforward. It's, it's quite clear how to generalize this to very different physical systems beyond where it was originally invented, namely the low-density gases. Okay. And um, so the, the two applications uh, are, are the nonlinear Schrödinger equation and, and uh, the, the sort of, I mean, slightly novel point. I mean, at least uh, I think it's actually, it is a very novel point, but, but you know, maybe it sort of cannot be so much appreciated. But, but uh, the point is that when, when you look at quantum systems, um, uh, what turns up is that the, the Boltzmann F function actually will become matrix valued. Okay, so that's sort of at the end of the talk a slightly new point, but otherwise I'm sort of reporting things which sort of are some time back. Okay, so now let me let me first sort of ah no maybe I should say I mean so so uh, sorry I mean um, 
Um, uh, maybe I should, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not giving any references here at all. I may hardly mention any names, which of course, you know, I mean, there's just no other choice. But I do want to mention that, uh, you know, the, the, the problem of having kinetic theory for waves and for quantum mechanical particles is the pioneering work of, of, uh, of Rudolf Piles. I mean, he was, he was uh, actually a student of Heisenberg and got his PhD in Leipzig. And uh, he did this work after he had moved to, to Zurich. And of course, there was some very strong help and advice uh, by Pauli. I mean, if you look at the acknowledgement, of course, Pauli is mentioned. But it's a very long and monumental work. And he both derived the equation for, for, for nonlinear interacting waves and for interacting quantum particles. Now, there are sort of two competing enterprises. I mean, this is Nordheim and uh, Uhling and Uhlenbeck, which are sort of, uh, Nordheim is a little bit earlier, and Uhling and Uhlenbeck is sort of a little bit later. But the main difference is that, I mean, these are actually fairly short papers, both of them. The main difference is they just guessed what should be the right equation. I mean, you know, once you understand that you should generalize it to a quantum mechanical situation, I mean, you can sort of, you know, do some guesses of what it might look like. And once the equation has the right properties, I mean, then you are sure that you have made the right guess. So the, the true sort of, you know, more in our modern terms, sort of the microscopic derivation is actually uh, due to uh, piles. I mean, nowadays, I mean, you know, presumably you might question how he actually did it. And I can certainly, if people are interested, I can explain more about this. But, but I mean, he really started the whole business. Okay, so now let me see what, uh, what I have prepared here. So this is maybe the most difficult slide because that's sort of the conceptual thing and I hope I can sort of explain this in such a way that, that you can see that it, it can generalize to, to many cases. So, um, uh, so let, let, let's look at the dynamics and let's first imagine that we have really a com spatially completely homogeneous system. I mean, spatial variation can be taken into account, but let, let, let's, life, let's keep life simple and imagine that you know, I have a completely uniform density throughout but the system is not in equilibrium, so the velocity distribution will be not a max value. And the question is, you know, what is the equation which will actually, uh, you know, govern the, the approach to equilibrium? Now, uh, one important point which is not so much emphasized is that uh, there, there's one property of the non-interacting gas which is used very heavily, namely, uh, of course, you know, we have a non-interacting theory. It's what in modern terms is sort of called an integrable theory because it has sort of, you know, the number of conserved quantities is sort of proportional to the number of degrees of freedom. And of course, you know, they just perform for free motion. So if I'm in the context of this classical gas, I mean, just have a huge number of particles, but all of them, they are not interacting. They're just moving completely freely, but they have one very general property. So here you imagine that it's spatially homogeneous, so all over sort of maybe a little bit random. You have all these particles and they're moving with particular velocities. And you sort of put your, uh, your, your, your window of observation is maybe sort of, you know, a particular region which, which uh, contains I mean, not, not extremely many, but it's, let's say, you know, a few particles or maybe a few thousand particles, okay? Now, and you look at this region and you ask yourself, what are you going to see when you wait for a very, very long time? Now, the assertion, because, you know, the particles are moving from infinity where they're sort of more or less independently, and so as you wait long enough, eventually you will see a situation which is actually time stationary. Now, of course, it's not relaxed to equilibrium because there's no mechanism how you get to equilibrium, but what you find is that, you, I mean, in modern terms, this is called a generalized Gibbs ensemble. What you find is that the positions are actually randomized and the velocities are essentially independent, but they do not have the max value distribution. They have some other distribution, which depends on how you sort of started the system initially. Okay? And uh, so if you want to put this sort of into, into, into some words, I mean, you know, sort of, uh, we have two parameters. We have the, the density of particles, which is uniform, so it's just a number, which tells us that relative to the density, you know, the positions are completely randomized. And then we have independent velocities, which I give here by uh, probability density function, which I call h, which is normalized to one, and the Boltzmann f function is simply this product. Okay, so, so, so this is sort of, uh, um, what, you, what, what you will see locally. I mean, the, 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 local, the local state is characterized already by this Boltzmann f function. Now, here I do this sort of, you know, uh, not very good picture because uh, I want to think of this huge space of, of all spatially homogeneous statistical distribution, which of course is enormous and, and uh, you know, I will not, nobody can sort of make a good picture, so let me just sort of draw this sort of huge set. But in this set, I mean, you have this one time, we have this sort of manifold of what I call Poisson. I mean, this, this is many folds which are sort of characterized by these 
with very specific statistical properties. As I change rho, or if I change this, uh, the, the, the momentum distribution of the particles, I will sort of move along this particular line. Now, in this pictorial picture, what you should see is that if I just do the free motion, I mean, no interaction yet, very quickly I will approach this, this, uh, this uh, Poisson manifold. In fact, once I have approached it, I simply stuck there. It doesn't move anymore because it's already stationary. Now you have the interaction, and now if you sort of combine things in the right way, I mean, it's not so surprising to imagine that um, uh, it's due to the collisions, I'm actually moving on this manifold. But I don't go very far away. I mean, I will not be somewhere out here. It basically, I'm sort of doing a motion on that manifold. And therefore, it's, uh, there will be a closed equation which tells you in, in which very precise way I'm moving on this manifold. Okay? And that precise equation, of course, is nothing else but the spatially homogeneous Boltzmann equation. So th this is difficult, and so um, you will not catch it immediately, but let me sort of repeat it maybe uh, in, in, in one, one other way of, of saying this. We sort of expresses this in a somewhat different way. Namely, there is this double role of the Boltzmann F function. One of them was just the counting. You see, I have a little region. I just count the number of particles in this region, and that's given by the Boltzmann F function. That's the number density. That's sort of, you know, on the kinetic scale, it's sort of a macroscopic type of quantity. On the other side, the Boltzmann F function tells you also what is the, what is the, 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 the local state. It tells you the, the, the statistical state um, uh, of uh, your particular system. Okay, so it's a, I put here, it's a unique label of the stationary center and the non-interacting dynamics. Okay? Now, it's this point which generalizes to you know, a large variety of systems. So the rule of the game is that you first have to look at your non-interacting dynamics. You have to figure out what are the time stationary distributions under this non-interacting dynamics. Once you have found them, then you can do sort of more or less a perturbation argument which tells you um, what, what would be uh, to include uh, uh, the role of the interaction. Okay? And so, so it's this scheme which, which I want to demonstrate you um, um, uh, for, for, for the examples which, which, which I prepared. Okay? So I don't know how much, I didn't look at the time. I mean, uh, uh, where is the... Okay, so I have to sort of uh, uh, make it not too long. Okay, so, so, so this, 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 these are waves. So now I'm looking at the wave field, um, which is sort of... Uh, I, I took the nonlinear Schrödinger equation, so you can see this over here. I have sort of a, a cutoff at short distances. This is why I sort of put this on a three-dimensional lattice, and this is the evolution of this wave field. Here you see the non-interacting theory, and here you see the nonlinearity, which gives you the interaction. Now. First rule, figure out what are the stationary solutions. Well, it's easy. They are just sort of Gaussian measures, uh, and uh, they're therefore uniquely uh, characterized by their covariance. And the psi, psi correlations are actually zero under, uh, under stationarity. And uh, the only cross correlation which you have is the psi star. That's the complex conjugate and the psi. This is the covariance function. It's a, it's a function of the difference because it's spatially homogeneous. And its Fourier transform is the analog of the Boltzmann equation. Now you figure out that the collision rate is, is of order lambda squared, so the mean free pass is 1 over lambda squared. And the picture which I had before is, of course, the same picture, but now this manifold, special manifold, are now, uh, consists now of Gaussian measures, which are sort of uh, this Gaussian manifold. And the same picture. I very quickly, under the free dynamics, I will move to this Gaussian manifold, and then there is sort of the slow motion, which is sort of includes uh, the particular type of interaction. Okay, so you get such kind of an equation, which we know already, uh, now it has a slightly different structure. It's cubic, and the reason why it's cubic is that, that uh, at some point, I mean, you have sort of this kind of pairing rule, and, and you see that I have three pairs, and so eventually this gives you a cubic uh, equation. You can prove an H theorem, and you can show that in the long time limit, you actually converge to uh, sort of a Gene's distribution, so that's sort of the high temperature limit of a, of a, of a Boltzmann uh, distribution. Okay. Now let's do the same thing for the... For the um, uh, ah, yeah. Now I want to say one word about the spatially inhomogeneous case. So if I want to do spatially inhomogeneous, then basically you should think that I have now a slow spatial variation on the kinetic scale. Okay? Now what is now the basic object which you have to look at? Now it turns out that it's something which is quite familiar to people you know, working in sort of on quantum mechanical uh, problems. 
Namely, it's nothing else but uh, because you have random initial data, it's a random Wigner function. So you see here, I, this is still classical evolution. So I have, uh, this is governed by a nonlinear wave equation, and here I'm forming, you know, the standard uh, uh, Wigner function, what you are used to, one particle Wigner function, and it's this object which eventually, if I do the appropriate scaling, will be governed by a kinetic equation of this type. We have, have the sort of collision term, which of course locally in, in the positions, and then there's a transfer term which uh, in, involves the group velocity. Okay? Now, we can do this uh, very easily, the same scheme uh, if I go to the quantum mechanical case. So here I'm looking now at interacting quantum particles, non-relativistic, uh, and again, the first rule, what are the stationary states under the free dynamics? Okay, that's an easy exercise. What you figure out, I mean, they are coherent states, so if I write down the density matrix, it will be sort of something which is quadratic in the fields. Okay. I can characterize them either by this function phi, but I can also look at the average Wigner function, average Wigner function for this thing, and therefore, what, what, what I should get is an evolution equation for this type of covariance, whose Fourier transform is, is uh, then the Wigner function. And on the kinetic scale, I mean, you get, again, uh, the usual kind of transfer. It's always spatially homogeneous. Only thing which I want to point out is that, uh, you know, I'm not writing down the, this collision term, but uh, it, it's now a sum of quadratic and cubic terms. And if by hand I sort of erase the cubic terms, then I'm back to the classical Boltzmann equation, which sort of corresponds just to the particles. On the other side, uh, if I ignite the, the particle lectures, uh, the, the particle properties, namely I sort of erase the quadratic term, then you get a purely a cubic equation, which is exactly the transport equation which I've written down for this nonlinear wave equation. There's an H theorem, the long time limit, you get to the Maxwell Waltz, uh, you get to the, to the Bose Einstein or, or, or the Fermi Dirac distribution, depending whether these fields are commuting or anti commuting. Okay. All right, so now I, I want to tell you sort of one sort of slightly more sort of tricky example, uh, just to illustrate the generality of that concept. Okay. So these are now quanta, but now I want to have internal degrees of freedom. Now, I look at a very specific system, which is sort of uh, loved by our, you know, colleagues from condensed matter physics, which is, uh, which is uh, the Fermi-Hubbard model. Uh, which is basically just a spin one half non relativistic quantum field, which is living on this three dimensional lattice. And uh, here you have to sort of the anti commutation relations. Now, my Hamiltonian, uh, you know, the dot refers to the spin degrees of freedom. So the main point is that this Hamiltonian is actually invariant under SU2. Okay, that, that, that's just what, what, what the dot guarantees you. Here you see the, the quadratic term, which is, of course, the free theory. And here you see uh, a standard sort of uh, uh, interaction. I mean, here I could do something more channel, but in any case, I mean, so, so this is sort of a typical on site interaction. Now, first question is what are the stationary states? Well, we know already that the stationary states are, are, are sort of Gaussian or coherent states or quasi free states. But now, when you look at the, their definition, you see that you also have to carry the spin index. This means that the Wigner function is now suddenly no longer a scalar function, it will be a two by two matrix. Okay? So the conclusion of this is that your internal degrees of freedom when you do kinetic theory remain quantized. So they just have to carry all the way through. I mean, it has to be quantized. I mean, this is, what, what, uh, the, this is the label of, of, uh, of, the, of the stationary states, okay? Now, what is the new element? Well, I mean, you see, what, what you get is that, um, um, first of all, I mean, which is sort of unusual for, for other systems, I mean, you, you get on the kinetic scale, sort of like an effective Hamiltonian, which depends linearly on this matrix-valued uh, uh, um, uh, Wigner function, but then you get a collision term over here. Now, this collision term, is a little bit uh, more lengthy, and, and so uh, I mean, I've written it already sort of in a nice way so that you can sort of see it. It's a little bit more complicated, uh, but nevertheless, I mean, uh, uh, the, the main point which I, I mean, I don't have time to explain every uh, little piece. I mean, there's energy conservation, momentum conservation, you have here this collision term. The main point which I want to emphasize is that you can see that, that you know, this one, this, this term is just the edge joint of this one. But I have to keep the oper operator order. I mean, they are just not equal. I mean, you know, because the W will be a two by two matrix, and so, so when writing down the equation, you carefully have to maintain operator ordering. Okay. All right. Now let's have just a brief look at um, 
at uh, what you can do. I mean, so uh, uh, these are sort of properties of this equation. So first of all, you know, you start off with fermions, which means that the W has to be between zero and one. I mean, so, you know, you better preserve this property. And indeed you do, whenever an eigenvalue of this W tries to hit, you know, the, the two boundaries, either zero or one, then it will be pushed backwards, which is due to an uh, operator identity or inequality, with which I didn't know before, but uh, it's a very useful operator inequality in this particular context. And in this case, it just ensures you whenever the eigenvalue is here, it's pushed inside the interval. So the Fermi property is propagated. Surprisingly enough, despite the fact that things are matrix valued, you still have uh, an H theorem. So this is the entropy, and there's an entropy production, and the entropy production is strictly positive. You want to know about stationary states? Well, you know, usually stationary states means that, that uh, you know, you just have to be, uh, it has to be just uh, acting with the collision operator, it has to be zero. This is an awfully difficult equation. Nobody knows what to do with this equation. And the magic idea of Boltzmann, and it works here equally well, is that rather looking at, at, at stationary solutions, I mean, you know, solutions which, which make this equal to zero, you, it's much better to actually look at, at the entropy production. So the asymptotic stationary stage which will you reach are actually those which have zero entropy production. Okay? So, so this is an equation which you can analyze. And the result of this analysis is that if I look at the solutions of this thing, it's a little bit complicated because it's a matrix, but the assertion is that there's a k-independent matrix. So, so this is just a two by two matrix, psi plus and psi minus. Important point, it's k-independent. And then there is sort of a particular weight, and uh, you see that it's the sum of these two projectors with the sort of diagonal term, which is sort of given by something which you know already very well. Okay? And from this, um, and I'm afraid that the time is sort of running out very quickly, so I cannot give too many explanations, but, but from this, what you, actually, what you actually find out is that there are two conservation laws. One is the SU2, which fixes a particular basis, and then, of course, there's the energy conservation. And now you start counting, you see there are two eigenvalues, these are the chemical potentials. The conservation of energy fixes the beta. So your initial condition fixes, in this case, both the basis and the chemical potentials and the inverse temperature. And then the assertion is that in that very particular basis, the off diagonal terms vanishes, whereas the diagonal terms do exactly what you want, namely they go to the, to the Fermi Dirac distribution, and that is the equilibrium sort of uh, distribution of your gas. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, let me just sort of try to summarize. Um, uh, so, I mean, I, we emphasize this dynamical picture. First, figure out what is your free dynamics, figure out what are the stationary solutions of the free dynamics, and it's those parameters which are governed by a kinetic equation. Okay? If you have internal degrees of freedom, then uh, this leads to a matrix-valued kinetic equation. And there's sort of, as the last thing, uh, there's one thing which is sort of, you know, there's this very active area and, and sort of uh, cold atoms, which sort of love these one-dimensional systems because they can be realized in the laboratory and you can analyze them also theoretically. And one of these famous models is, is uh, the Lieblinger, which is sort of the delta Bose gas, where particles are sort of on the line, are uh, bosons on the line which are interacting by delta potential. Now, this is an integrable system. So you will have many, many stationary solutions. You will have many, many conserved quantities. Now you can do kinetic theory. How do you do kinetic theory? Well, I mean, you know, the, the sort of the, the GGE is something which is of this type. Here are all the, all the sort of, uh, you know, uh, sort of generalized temperatures. Uh, here are all the conserved charges. Now you add to this a weak short-range potential, and it's this weak short-range potential which will drive you to the correct thermal equilibrium. <laughs> And now you can do kinetic theory exactly according to the principle which I explained to you. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs>